I was so depressed, and I went and got the Bible, and I turned to the Book of Revelation. And if people would just get read the Bible and read the Book of Revelation, they would really turn around and straighten up. Sisters, niggas, whiteies, Jews, crackers, don't worry, if there's hell below, we're all gonna go. The FBI says that these girls were on their way to Syria, recruited by ISIS. Friends of the girls in the Cherry Creek School District noticed concerning tweets, alerted the district, and the district then called the home of the girls. That resulted in a search, and the district believes the FBI became involved just in time. Put it to their cause. They believe they are anointed by their God and they have no doubt that killing someone as publicly and brutally as possible will change the world, including their own countries, their friends, their family, the innocents. We have to come to some hard conclusion about stopping homegrown terrorists. We hear stories almost every day about the possibility of someone being a homegrown terrorist, and now they are facing this in Canada as well, somebody they knew to be a potential danger to citizens. Are we simply doing enough of a good job? Are we doing enough to try and find them, to understand them, and to root them out before they kill somebody. The continuum of radicalization starts long before where they get pulled into this Islamo-patriotism, where they feel an allegiance to the jihadist movement, the Islamic State, or not only that Islamic State, but all Islamic States against the West, against the secular nation-state of America. Hello, and welcome again to this edition my video slash synopsis slash excerpt short story which is to say this ninth edition is a continuation of number eight it's one chapter narrative it's an excerpt portion from my overall 400 page historical fictitious novel manuscript the novel is entitled colors ancient african connection to the founding of the American Empire and the makings of the Crips and the Bloods. This short story portion of that excerpt, this excerpt short portion of that book uh, is an excerpt, one chapter titled From Ship to Shore. Colors Ancient African Connection Part 9 and 8 is yet another attempt to introduce my anti-gang pro-American literary creative work to society in the effort to break the antagonistic separatist gap that exists between the Crips and the Bloods, the Northanians and the Serenios, as well as other inner city so-called street gangs who are actually inner city subcultural groups of misinformed, misguided, and misunderstood young Americans who we in society has thus far over the years demonized as outcasts when, if only we in society would rethink our negative perception of these young 21st century concrete jungle warriors and perhaps they would rethink their perception of themselves. By their very nature, these so-called street gangs are camaraderie as a united cohesive force, which is to say the Crips and the Bloods and Arthanians and the Serenios, and universally speaking, street gangs in particular have a natural inborn instinct to, as the Marines say, never leave a comrade behind. Thus is an example of a force within our American society which should be reckoned with, understood, and maybe to be felt to be respected. But if the truth be told and told in a way that these misunderstood, misguided, and miseducated young subcultural groups of our minorities, Americans will pay attention to and possibly take note. 
The real detrimental threat to America is coming at us from outside. Resources which are being used to combat the street violence and property damage associated with gang warfare can be diverted elsewhere instead of trying to fight and eliminate street gangs because that's never going to happen, which is why I say use them or lose them. And my book points this out in suspenseful, adventurous, and historical storytelling tradition. My story takes place at that same point in time in history as Alec Haley's magnificent historical fictitious epic saga titled Roots. Alec Haley's Roots was a window that gave us a glimpse into the transatlantic slave trade. The transatlantic slave trade was that watery highway that bad Christians used to transport millions of Africans by ship from Africa to America. My story is a glimpse into the trans saharan slave trade, which was a desert highway used by bad Muslims to transport Africans from Africa to Europe and Asia. Even today, Africans are being used and abused by bad Muslims. Certain subcultural groups of Arab Muslims, far worse subcultural groups of Arabs than our young misguided, misunderstood, and miseducated subcultural groups of African Americans and Mexican Americans. My book, In a Roundabout Way, touches on the fact that even today Africans are being used and abused by bad Muslims. Certain subcultural groups of Arab Muslims, far worse subcultural groups of Arabs than our young misguided, misunderstood, and miseducated subcultural groups of African Americans and Mexican Americans. My short story narrative left off with my introduction of Sonny Red's father, who they called Red Rock. The same system that Red Rock and his underground guerrilla movement was bucking, they bucked back. And Red Rock wound up being sentenced to life by that very same system for the system within the system's maximum state prison is where Red Rock was first transferred to Folsom State Prison is where he quickly lived up to his violent legacy and reputation as a fearless vanguard urban guerrilla warrior by attacking a CDC officer, Department of Corrections prison guard in other words. Red Rock assaulted the officer with the officer's own baton and Rock was sent from Folsom to San Quentin prison which at the time San Quentin was the end of the line. That's where the worst of the worst violent convicts was housed, including those convicts condemned to die for their crimes. They were all housed on San Quentin's death row, the ultimate end of the line. Sonny Red and his father, Sonny Sr., better known as Red Rock, had too few opportunities to sit and talk one-on-one -on -one before Red Rock went off to prison. So, Sonny Red, like many of society's youth today, was left to navigate his own way through life and into understanding himself and the society in which he lived back in the day. For the most part, Sonny Red's personal views and perceptions were derived from what he learned on the streets, more so probably than words could convey anyway. Sonny's mother, he remembered, would write a letter to his father in prison religiously every night before she went to bed. Oftentimes, she'd mail seven or eight letters a week for more than a year in the beginning of her husband's incarceration. Sonny Red can't recall ever seeing his mother receive a single letter from his father in return. Finally, his mother surrendered to drugs to ease her sorrow until she became addicted and it was all about the next fix. Strung out and homeless, Ebony Damu wound up depending on Sunny Red for her dope money. Although she refused all Sunny Red's efforts 
to help her in other areas. She refused food, even though she went from a healthy, attractive 175 pounds to 60 pounds of neglected skin and bones. Sonny also attempted to convince his mother, Ebony, that his court-appointed foster parents wouldn't object to him bringing his mother into their home to share his bedroom. The room was surely large enough, and after all, his foster parents, whom he has lived with ever since he was 14 years old, also said that his bedroom was his to do with what he wanted. But, of course, Ebony, his mother, would always brush off such childish notions, and in her desperate quest for drugs, Ebony would practically demand that Sonny give her cash money. Whatever amount of pocket money Sonny would have at the time, he'd hand it over to his mother. And, like a thief in the night, Ebony would take the dope money and drop out of sight back into the mean depths of society's concrete swamp section of the urban jungle. Until the next time mother and son meet, Sonny will empty his pockets to her right there on the streets and be left standing there on the sidewalk watching helplessly as his poor mother disappeared. Whenever possible, though, Sonny would reiterate his promise to Ebony that someday he would buy her a house, but that he expected her to keep her word and stop using crack cocaine. That someday finally arrived two months ago. Sonny placed a fat down payment on a house out in Brentwood, California, a semi affluent suburb with two thirds of the $10,000 so called gift he received from the male secretary of a sports consultant firm representing the college scout who is said to represent a major local university. <clears throat> in actuality, Pete Goldman was his name, he is a slick opportunist. He's a sports agent, agent who jumped ahead of the competition by reeling in the biggest young fish among the rich pool of Vermont high schools graduating seniors this year. Sonny was by far the apple in the eye of any legitimate college football scouts nationwide. Had Sonny not been impatient signing on with this Pete Goldman character, Sonny Red would have waited until official draft day and he would have chosen Gremlin University since Sonny Red had deep family roots in Louisiana. According to his father, during those rare one-on-one -on -one conversations, the family's first African ancestors to reach America arrived aboard a slave ship that landed at New Orleans around 1850. His family link to Gramlin College is well known in that his grandfather went to Gramlin and played quarterback on the 1962 Tigers team that set the record for most touchdowns in the annual Bayou Classic against Southern University. Sonny Red's grandmother too went to Gramlin and played in the marching band. Gramlin was one of several big name colleges with elite football teams that offered Sonny a full scholarship if he signed with them. They even hinted of an under-the-table cash bonus if he waited until official draft day. But first come, first serve, and this Pete Goldman character caught Sonny at just the right time. Sonny was so desperate and determined to get his mother off the streets and into a house that he wound up being sold. He sold his soul to the devil without a doubt. Instead, all Sonny was required to sell was his quarterbacking skills. Keep his mouth shut and by no means try to renege on Pete Goldman's under the table deal. Sonny received enough money up front to buy him to the house that he promised his mother he would. However, his mother didn't keep her word after she moved in. She didn't stop using crack and in fact she turned the house into a crack den. Initially, Sonny's short-term plan was to move in with his mother, but the dope house atmosphere was hardly conducive to Sonny's long-term plans of becoming a pro football NFL player. 
Occasionally, Sonny would go by the house, of course, to check on his mother, knowing all too well what to expect. Therefore, he would bring a cleanup crew with him to clear out the crack zombies and drug dealers. He'd bring with him his teammates, Big Ace, the captain of the Viking offensive line, who played right tackle, the most vital position on offense as far as protecting the quarterback in the pocket and Kudaman, the 300-pound center, who got his name because of his small head and short neck that sits on a massive, muscular, broad chest and wide, expanding shoulders like a giant kuda, a log-head turtle, in other words, standing upright. Kudaman was that terrifying center, pound for pound, at his young age, to have ever hiked a college football just his presence on the offensive line hunched over the football resting safely between his legs as he stared his components down with the look of a ferocious bear protecting a tiny cub. Opposing defensive players struck with instant fear every time they lined up opposite the cooler man. Sonny Red hadn't been by his mother's house in days. Long absences like this seem to always result in more crack addicts that have to be cleared out when Sonny finally do a ride with his cleanup crew, Big Ace and Cooter Man. So, this day, Sonny didn't know what to expect as he rounded up Big Ace and Cooter Man and they paid a visit to the house to check on Ebony. Sonny's timing couldn't have been worse. In fact, had he and his crew arrived just 10 minutes later in time, they would have been one of the many wide-eyed spectators that gathered outside the house watching the aftermath of the police raid. Sonny, Big Ace, and Cooter Man weren't in the house 10 minutes doing their thing, rounding up the drugged-out crack addicts when suddenly the real heavily armed Los Angeles task force and DEE agents burst through the front door and the back door simultaneously as if twin bombs had just exploded. Everyone inside the house was manhandled, handcuffed, and charted off to jail, including Sonny Big Ace and Cooter Man. Unlike Sonny's house cleaning efforts, the police were professionally thorough in their cleanup, finding drugs of all kinds stashed in every room about the house. Unbeknown to Sonny, Ebony's dope attic house guests would always prepare themselves for Sonny's raids on the house by hiding their drugs and simply returning to them after Sonny and his crew departed the premises. The amount of hidden drugs discovered this day was substantial enough to charge everyone in the house with felony drug possession with the intent to sell. Pete Goldman didn't waste any time posting Sonny's bail in a desperate effort to avoid the news media, but Pete Goldman didn't quite move fast enough before the press got wind of the local hero's arrest. Sonny Red might have slipped under the radar had he accepted bail on the day he went to jail as Pete Goldman reigned, but when the bail bondsman showed up to spring Sonny less than three hours after his arrest, Sonny refused to leave Big Ace and Cooter Man behind, not to mention his mother. He demanded that Pete Goldman go their bail as well. Of course, Pete Goldman was distraught about Sonny being arrested in the first place, and he was especially disturbed by Sonny's insistence that he post bail for the others. But Pete Goldman was also well aware that he was potentially under the gun, and Sonny's finger was on the trigger. If Sonny were to cooperate with the inevitable police investigation, Pete Goldman's involvement in illegal recruiting in violation of the public high school recruiting policies would in his professional career if he even had one for sure. And then there's the possibility that he, Pete Goldman, could face criminal charges for distributing to the delinquency of a minor. Sonny concocted a story that should have killed two birds with one stone, but it didn't. Sonny claimed the money to 
buying a house came from selling drugs and that the drugs in the house was all his. The story satisfied the police inspectors enough that the charges against his mother, Big Ace and Cooter Man, were dropped and his case remained pending in court. But the Los Angeles School Board held their own court on the matter and, in light of Sonny's admission of selling drugs, it was inevitable that Sonny Red would be stripped of his scholarship eligibility, suspended from school, and he would never play another football game wearing a Vikings football jersey ever again. But, as the old saying goes, never say never. Sonny had friends in high places, so high in fact that his young, still adolescent mind hadn't yet reached the mental level of perception to even perceive that these hidden power brokers existed, along with a certain quiet, reclusive teammate of his named Darnell Tuffy Fuller, a dynamic running back from Louisiana, is the talk of the town. The red hot debate among sportcasters is which of these two Viking superstars will win MVIP. Sonny Red with his straight shooting cannon of an arm or Tuffy, the fullback with the explosive takeoff and powerful forward surge that everyone compared to the great running back Jim Brown. Darnell Tuffy Fuller is a solid built, six foot four, two hundred and fifty pound scrapping country boy from Shreveport, Louisiana. A naturally born, so it seemed, athletic wonder boy. Tuffy shattered all school records in every phase of the running back position at the little known high school that he transferred from, named George Washington Carver. The coaching staff at George Washington Carver recognized Tuffy's unique athletic talent the first day of football trials. Tuffy showed up in full uniform, however, oddly enough, the trials weren't scheduled to take place until after school, yet that day and every day of a scheduled football game or an after-school practice drill, Tuffy would arrive at school always dressed in full gear except for his shoulder pads. And after practice or a regular game, Tuffy would always shower, would not shower with the others, and he would always leave school the way he arrived in full uniform. As strange as it seemed, Tuffy's coach and his teammates assumed that his behavior was mere dedication because one thing was certain, strange habits and all, Tuffy was the best young ball carrier anyone had ever seen running a football across the green of a high school football stadium. If Darnell Tuffy Full of had possessed and exhibited signs of being a natural prodigy son in the area of academics or mathematics, he would have drawn the attention of a Harvard, Yale, or some other prestigious Ivory League institution of supreme learning. But as it is, Tuffy proved to be an athletic phenomenon, and so he drew the attention of the powers that be at USC one of the elite colleges known for cultivating and grooming athletes with natural elite talent of a prodigy nature, a physical prodigy son, if you will. Tuffy's old coach, a young upstart named Jacob Fox, happened to be a native Californian and a University of Southern California USC graduate. Jacob Fox did his coaching intern at USC, joined the Trojan coaching staff for one semester, and found that coaching at a big name swanky college in a big bustling city was just not his cup of tea. So, Tuffy's old junior high school coach Jacob Fox campaign for a less stressful coaching job in a small, relaxed town, any town, and sure enough, Jacob Fox landed a head coaching job more to his liking in a little backwoods town outside Shreveport, Louisiana called George Washington Carver. 
No one outside Louisiana had even heard of a high school named George Washington Carver, let alone their football team, fittingly named the Fighting Rebels. Not, that is, until Jacob Fox, the young rookie coach, discovered Darnell Tuffy Fuller's extraordinary athletic talent. Through his USC connection, Jacob Fox put Tuffy on that elite road to fame and fortune, and himself, the little backwoods high school coach, and the school was put on the map. Tuffy and his mother, along with a little sister lived in a modest house not far from George Washington Carver High School and his sister's elementary school. He and his little sister and their little family was a tight-knit family, but they were living off his deceased father's military pension, which would have paid for Tuffy's college tuition, which is why Tuffy wasn't that high on playing football just to win a high-flying college scholarship to fortune and fame. But his mother, Edna Faithful Love, on the other hand, carved the glamorous life. She craved the glamorous life and wanted Tuffy to think big like her. Edna Faith knew the secret of Tuffy's extraordinary athletic ability and she wanted him to use it for all it was worth. And more importantly, she wanted him to use it as his father would have wanted him to if he were alive. Because Tuffy's father, who was killed in action in the Vietnam War, passed on the secret to Tuffy as it was passed on to him from his father all the way back to 1850 in the landing of his enslaved African forefather, a great-great-grandfather named Tui Dugadu, aboard a slave ship, who arrived in chain aboard the slave ship. So, when Tuffy's mysterious handler, for that's all you can call someone who from out of the blue during the middle of football season come put a $10,000 cashier's check in their hand along with three one-way airline tickets and address to a three-bedroom home in Los Angeles, California, said to be your very own. That's pretty much how Tuffy was handed his ticket to fame and fortune every aspect of which was done through his managerial mother, Edna Faye. It was given, she was given instructions to re-enroll Tuffy into a prearranged high school, Vermont. She was to make certain her prodigy son keep his grades up and just continue doing what he do the best, play exceptional football and in turn someone else whom Edna Faye need not concern herself, will take care of all the rest. Last year's football season was a near disaster for the high-powered, unstoppable, mighty Vikings of Vermont High, out west in Southern California. Around mid-season, it was clear to see that the Vikings' winning streak was in jeopardy on the account of serious season-ending injuries to four of the team's key offensive players. Three of Sonny Red, the quarterbacks, go to wide receivers as well as the team's best tight end behind Sonny Surefine Cannon and a dynamic trio of speedy, sure-handed receivers. The mighty Vikings average 40 points a game against better-than-average teams within the Western District Company. Not since Sonny Red, with his golden arm, took over the helm at quarterback has the Vikings lost a single game. If the Vikings could just keep winning, they'll set the Western Conference record for the most undefeated seasons. Tuffy's mid-season transfer and acquisition into the offensive scheme last year was a godsend. Not only did Tuffy save the day and help preserve the Vikings' undefeated win streak, but he added a new dimension to the Viking offensive scheme. He was put in the fullback position since all the Vikings' running backs were helping well. Tuffy played the position as if he was three players in one, tight end, wide receiver, as well as running back. So amazingly versatile 
was Tuffy that he became Sonny Red's go-to receiver. And when Tuffy wasn't assigned to run a route down the field, he held the scrimmage line with the best of them, helping protect the quarterback. And whenever in trouble, Sonny always looked for Tuffy, who always seemed to be close by. And if any inkling of daylight is seen in between Sonny Red and Tuffy, Sonny Red would fire the ball to Tuffy like a heat seeking missile. And Tuffy would out fail and would catch it and run toward the end zone like a bat out of hell. Time and time again, game after game, together, Sonny and Tuffy practically dominated every game. The dynamic odd duo is a marketing name local sportscasters pinned on Sonny Red and Tuffy. And indeed, they the two superstars everyone wanted to see. But of course, Sonny and Tuffy couldn't and wouldn't have become that dynamic odd duo without a mighty supporting cast, which is why the team as a whole so dynamically lived up to the name Mighty Vikings. Without a doubt, the Mighty Vikings was on the verge of making high school history, if, that is, they come away from the big game day after tomorrow with a win.